I saw my first riot from the seventh floor of a Kiev hotel room in the former Soviet Union about uh, two and a half years after the Berlin Wall had fallen. I was invited there to give a series of lectures at the Kiev Polytechnical Institute on faith, but they'd warned us tensions were a bit high in the changing environment, some disturbances over food shortages. So when at 6.30 on a Tuesday morning, I heard screaming in the plaza, I jumped out of my bed rushed to the balcony and looked down to see nearly 200 people crowded into this plaza and a big truck in the middle, screaming and yelling, people waving paper, beating on the truck, and a couple of guys with crates. And I thought, what are they unloading? Weapons? Ah, well, I did what any good American tourist would do. I grabbed my clothes and my camera and I ran for the lobby. I got to the elevator, took the ride down, but nothing could have prepared me for what I would see when I burst across the lobby and threw open the doors and the plaza was empty. I'm not joking. Maybe five minutes from my room to there. The truck was gone, the people were gone. I thought, did I dream it? So I turned to the doorman and said, what happened? He only spoke Ukrainian, but understood my gesture and said, Apollos and Cholovekith. What? The desk clerk spoke great English. It's the orange men. Orange men? I had no idea what that was. But then he told me this story. There were a couple of guys who worked in an orange grove, maybe uh, two hours outside Kiev, that knew fresh fruit was wanted, but they didn't have a store, and one of them got a brilliant idea. What if we get a truck? So they borrowed a truck, drove that bad boy in every other Tuesday at the ungodly hour of 6.30, and a riot ensued. The paper they were waving was money. And those boys sold out their truck in five minutes and drove away with a pile of money between them. What a brilliant, creative move. But that was not what was so amazing. No, it was what I learned in the next moment that changed my life and sent me on a 30-year journey of study and research about creativity and where it comes from. It was a simple question. I just asked the desk clerk, so... What day do the lettuce ladies come by? Because I want to get a picture. Or maybe the egg boys or the tomato guys. And he stared at me and said, no, there's only the orange men. Think about it. Two years of freedom. Why is nobody jumping on this creative bandwagon? I hadn't seen a riot. What I'd seen was the reinsurgence of creativity into a system that had choked it out for decades, like grass coming up through the cracks in the asphalt. And I began to wonder, why does creativity blossom here and die here? Oh, the answer to that was much bigger and smaller than I could ever have imagined. In business, oh, we've all seen all the surveys and studies about how important creativity is in the modern worker. Our great colleagues up at Stanford, just up the road from Pepperdine, brought out a study last year that said, I think they listed 30 different creative qualities and asked CEOs to rank them in the order of the kind of employees that they were looking for. Anybody want to guess what the number one quality these CEOs said they had to have? Come on, starts with a C, ends with creativity. Take your time on this one. Yeah, creativity. But in all the books and the places that I'd looked, I couldn't find what the truth was that I knew in my heart. Oh, I found books on how you can train yourself to be creative or who gifted creative people are. But this is what I discovered. From talking to creative leaders in, in boardrooms and warehouses and laboratories and classrooms, folks, creativity is not a gift given to a special few, nor is it a skill that you need to learn or master in a classroom or laboratory. Creativity is the natural response of a human being when they're in the right atmosphere. My big idea, if you want to be creative and have those around you be creative, you have to learn how to create an atmosphere for creativity. Think of uh, NASA scientists who have to put together just the right atmosphere, just the right oxygen helium inside that astronaut suit so they can be at their most mental and physical best. Well, from talking to folks around the globe and across a number of different disciplines, I found there's five factors that are the key to a creative atmosphere. And in the next 8.2 minutes, I'm going to tell you exactly what they are. So if you want to get something out to write the... No, no, wait, stop. 
don't move. Do not write this down. Because if I can't give a presentation on creativity in a creative way, I ought to be booed off the stage. So let's be creative about this. Um, get your right hand out. Did you bring it with you? Most of you did, good. Get your right hand out and put your thumb up like this and say the word fun. fun. Yeah, and, and look at your thumb when you say it one more time, fun. fun. I want you to imprint that word right there because the number one factor in the creative atmospheres all over was fun. Now I know it doesn't sound very scientific, but if I asked you to go find the most creative people in Los Angeles, you better not go to a studio or a gallery. Go to an elementary school at recess, and you'll see creativity all over. It's natural until it gets drummed out of us when the recess bell rings and you have to go back in the classroom and line up and draw inside the box. We've all heard Ken Robinson's brilliant speeches, if you haven't listened to them, about how schools can just squeeze the fun out of life. And squeeze the creativity out at the same time. I'll tell this quick, in the 1990s, I got a chance to meet the leader of the team from Hewlett Packard that developed bubble jet technology. It was a big deal in its day, I promise. And when I went into his office, I was expecting charts and graphs and you know all kinds of instruments. Guess what I found on his shelves? Toys, tons of them. He says that when our team has fun, we're more creative. Now. Fast forward nearly 30 years, when I walked into the headquarters of Riot Gaming. Anybody here ever played League of Legends? Yeah, big money maker. Guess what was in their office? Oh my word, foosball tables and ping pong tables. And you find that as well up in Silicon Valley because we've rediscovered what Maria Montessori taught in 1889 when she said that creativity and learning takes place when children are allowed to have to play, to enjoy life. So, principle one, you want to create an atmosphere of creativity? Bring some of this with you. Somebody bring the chips, somebody bring the dips, you bring the fun, all right? I had somebody come up to me after a presentation like this and said, I'm not, I'm not really a very positive and fun person. And so I borrowed a, a term from the religion department and said, repent, just change. Your family will be thankful that you did. Don't be the person on the team that can brighten up a room by leaving it. You want to bring this. Now you say, well, how do I do that? Here's an easy one. Just start laughing more. A guy named Gary Palmer, a former um, professor at BYU, did this wonderful study on laughter. He said kids laugh a whole lot more than adults. Kids laugh about 400 times a day on an average, he said. Adults, 15 to 20. Yeah, I know. Look around the adults around you. Am I right? Maybe five or 10 for you, sir. I mean, the reality is that we are naturally, oh, it's so serious when we get the work done. What we do is we cramp the creativity. So everybody say, bring the fun. Bring the fun. Second thing, take this finger and put it up and do this. Yeah, you just proved that you can be flexible. <laughs> Some people around you are shocked that work with you. I know this. What I found is the second principle of that creative atmosphere is that you have to leave people room to try new things. If you're one of those people who is like, I can't eat unless I'm sitting at the same place at the dinner table, you've got to get some creative stretch going. My favorite story about this comes from the Philips company and a guy I met who told me that Philips had invented the technology that eventually led to the CD. Everybody knows what a CD is, right? Do you know what it stands for? It stands for compact disc. You know why they call it a compact disc? Because <laughs> in 1963, Philips brought out this wonderful technology and they put it on a laser disc. Anybody want to guess how big a laser disc was? The same size as an LP. Oh yeah, there was just one size. You want to kill a creative atmosphere? Just say, this is not the way we do it here. It's not our policy. I'm sorry, that's not allowed. My bet is, as a friend of mine says, the cure to cancer is out there about that far away someplace. So will you help? Will you create an atmosphere of flexibility by learning to be flexible yourself? My doctor says you want to be more flexible? Stretch. So here's a stretch for you. When you go out at the break, eat a snack that you don't normally eat. When you drive home, drive a different way home than you normally drive. Now I know your brain's saying, but we already know the shortest way. We know the way. Yeah, that's what happens. But when we flex, we find and see things we'd otherwise miss. And that's what was in all these creative atmospheres. So we've got this, which is quickly, and this, which is 
All right, now the third one. I know some of you are worried about the third finger. This is a Christian institution, and I've got this under control. So take your hand and do this, and now do this if you would. And do it to the person next to you. Go ahead. It's called positive feedback. Say it out loud. Positive feedback. What I found is that these creative team leaders learned that if they gave positive feedback to those around them, they would blossom. And negative feedback? Hmm. You know, I love the work of cartoonist Gordon McKenzie, the late Gordon McKenzie. But what I love the most is what he used to do in schools. He did a kind of a personal survey. He'd go in to speak on art and stand in front of a kindergarten class and say, how many here are artists? Every hand went up. By the time he got to third grade, only half of the hands went up. And in fifth grade, two or three brave students would raise their hand as an artist. McKinsey said they were absolutely criticized out of their creativity. That doesn't look like a horse, that looks like a worm. That's a stupid drawing. And they listened and it was remembered. You tell me what you remember more. Somebody who compliments you or somebody who says, that is an ugly shirt. Oh, you carry that with you for years, don't you? Because that's the way our brains work. My dad used to say, it takes 10 attaboys to counteract every one you blew it. And Teresa Amabile of the Harvard School of Business uh, said my dad was right. She did a study working with scientists and looking at diaries of what they did during the day and found that negative things were so much more powerful than the positive. Here's the quote. The power of a setback to increase frustration is over three times as strong as the power of progress to decrease it. In other words, a negative event has three times the power of a positive event. Guess what that means if you're going to create an atmosphere of positive what? Feedback. That means you've got to give a lot of positive feedback, encouragement. Now, the easiest way to do that, practical tip, stop the complaining and whining and griping. Uh, it's a national sport. I understand it. But I'm going to ask you to help our world be more creative by just getting that out of your mouth so you got more room for the positive stuff. Here, take the pledge. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I will, to the best of my ability, not whine, gripe, or complain about anything for the next 24 hours, even if it deserves it. Yeah, yeah. See, some are going, you're going to have to start over, sir. He said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard right there. <laughs> and others are saying, it's going to be pretty quiet at the break. We won't have anything to talk about if we can't criticize the speeches. On behalf of your children, on behalf of your coworkers, on behalf of a world that needs creativity, let's be the ones that give some positive feedback that might free up a thought, which takes me to this, number four. Can you do this with your hand? The old Boy Scout sign of faithfulness. A faithful environment is necessary for people to feel free to be creative. What do I mean by a faithful environment? I mean an environment in which you are safe. This came from a Department of Agriculture study. They did a study of small farms and found that many small farms were outpacing the big corporate, well-moneyed, larger farms, especially in safety issues. Then they dug deeper and found out why. Those small farms, they're family farms. In this kind of farm, the big farm, you find a safety issue, you write them up, you, 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 know, you, you turn them in, you send an email. But in a family farm, if Uncle Bob leaves the pail out, you just put it back. He's your uncle, right? We're family. We've got each other's back. I'm not going to run and tattle on him. Besides, you know, in a family farm, you can't fire Uncle Bob. You'd have to kill him, and you don't want to do that. So... <laughs> So a faithful atmosphere creates this place where people think, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing to, to take a swing, which leads me to the last one. Quick review. Lots of. And then an atmosphere that is faithful. Now take your hand and open it up and reach down and pick up someone who has failed, fallen. How do you respond to failure? Most of us run the other way. Risk aversion. I don't want to try anything that's going to be too difficult. And yet, creativity demands accepting and appreciating failure. Here at Pepperdine, if our scientists in the laboratory said, now never try an experiment that's going to fail, they could just close the doors now. Because failure is part of the creative process. 
Oh, come on. You know this is a human being. None of you would have ever learned to walk, except that you got up one more time than you fell down. You've seen parents, right? Come on, come on, take a step, take a step. No baby goes, oh, T for two. It's not going to happen. <laughs> What's the baby going to do the first time? He's going to fall down. Aren't we glad that he doesn't have our sensibility? Because we'd fall down and say, oh, what a bad experience. That's so embarrassing. I never want to do that again. <laughs> and then 90% of you would have crawled in here today. <laughs> Beth, why don't you walk? I had a bad time a long time ago. I just <laughs> avoid it. Let me get into my chair. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Ask Justin Turner, great baseball player. You know what his batting average is? Today, I think I looked up 345 or something like that. Man, he's getting paid the big bucks for it. Pause a second. 345 means nearly seven times out of 10, the guy fails. And yet he gets millions. Why? Because we all know you'll never hit a home run if you won't swing. Besides, who is anybody else to tell you what you just did was a failure? <laughs> a middle-aged architect stood on the top floor of the structure he was building and wept. The city had already decided it was ugly. The papers were scathing. Everyone was backing away from him. And I've got to believe that he must have looked down off the building and thought, why don't I just jump? Why don't I just end it right now? But you know what I've always believed? I've always believed there was somebody in his circle that was there saying, don't, keep going. Don't let anyone tell you your building is a failure. Gustav, your tower is amazing. Wow. Yeah. Oh, by the way, talk about creative. Guess what Gustav Eiffel had designed before that? Railroad bridges. He just decided to turn one on the end. And we got the Eiffel Tower. And appreciating. OK, give me a second to dream before I walk off, will you? I just wonder. I wonder what could happen in your family, in your workplace, with your friends. I wonder what solutions that our world desperately needs to the problems we are facing might happen. If you just create an atmosphere around you where people can be creative, and don't you dare say, well, I don't know how to do that. Oh, come on. Everything you need, you've got right in your hand. Get after it. Ah.